Like uh, Potato Bug Bill. Remember that story with Grandpa said? No. Potato Bug Bill. He was the toughest kid in town. He lived on the, in the toughest section of town, lived in the toughest street in town, the last house on that street, and upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Potato Bug Bill. <laughs> that was Otto's story. Now, why did Grandpa come to Jamestown? Well, he got why out of... You, why did your dad come to Jamestown? Yeah, right. He got out of service, and... Uh, he was single, of course, and he went out and visited his brother Oscar uh, out in the uh, state of Washington in Walla Walla, and he uh, ran or rented out and r ran it, a uh, pool room out there. So uh, he was some kind of a hustler, I guess. He was a pretty good pool player, I guess, and so was Oscar. And he ran that for a while, and I don't know whatever happened. He never talked much about it. And he came back to uh, this part of the country, and uh, Jamestown then, the uh, furniture industry was thriving, so he went to work in a factory. And he'd been wounded, of course, you know, uh, had bad lungs from being gassed and all that stuff there. And the dust in the factory bothered him. And he, of course, ended up somehow going to a doctor. A doctor said, you got to get out. you got to work outside. And uh, Dad said, well, you know, I don't know any. I mean, I'm, my job, i got to make a living. Well, he said, you got to find something else. So he told the guy that owned the, the business that uh, he had to leave. And in the meantime, it scouted around and found out he could sell furniture for somebody. And this was Carlyle Johnson. And he told... Otto, he says, you don't know how to sell furniture. He says, you stick with me and I'll make you a foreman and you'll, you'll do well in the, in the factory. You know what factory it was? Uh, elite. But he did that for about 40 years. I guess he sold furniture. What was uh, his territory? Uh, Western Pennsylvania. Was it? Yeah. Plus he had, uh, for certain lines, he had Scranton and Wilkesboro, some Eastern stuff. And that was a two week trip. And uh, it was okay when he was, when he was younger because he couldn't get home. He, you know, the weekends he'd sit down there and, like he says, sit in the parks and pee, feed pigeons and stuff. It was, you know, not, not a lot of fun. He was the eighth kid, and that's how he got the name Uth, you know, and, and that's how he, Otto, you know, that was, he was the eighth, uh, eighth child born. Okay. Yeah, very, very, yeah, it was very heavy. Yeah, he probably weighed 5'10", and his most weight, maybe 240, 245. Mm -hmm. And uh, the doctor scared him into losing weight, and maybe in his declining years he was lost 30, 40 pounds mm -hmm. of that, probably, you know, he's, he was a 200 pounder, there's no question about that. Smoked? Yeah. Smoked, yeah, very heavily, yeah, he could get up. Why did, why did your mother come to Jamestown? Well, Brookston, you know, the tannery was, was uh, everything down in Pennsylvania and those little towns, Ludlow and, and Brookston, the tanneries were dying. And for girls, there wasn't much of an opportunity down there, and uh, they didn't get there any education or anything like that. And again, mother came from a big family, so schooling was out, and uh, when they finished their school, that they became domestics. And Jamestown, um, you know, was the bigger city, and offered him a chance to uh, get into uh, domestic work, and that's what she came here to be a maid, and she was. Do you remember and who she worked course, for? Huh? Do you remember who she worked for? Well, no, no, not not as a, not as a young girl, I don't. But I know later in life, she worked at a national worship mill, like I told you, with uh, with nanny in it, and that was, of course, uh, a much better job than being a domestic, because you had more free time. Rach, of course, was, she was a guardian angel in my family always. Everybody ended up at our house from yeah. both sides of the family, Peterson's as well as Carlson's. Yeah. We, uh, that's one thing I got to know my cousins better than anybody because they did come to my folks' house. They were always an open invitation. You're born and you're on Faulkner Street. Mm -hmm. How long were you on Faulkner Street? Mm, just a couple of years. Okay. And then we, then we uh, moved up to uh, rented a house on Sturgis Street, 75 Sturgis. And uh, that's where I had my... Uh, my bread butter factory, my uh, newspaper, my detective agency. Mm -hmm. I had all those things going <laughs> as a kid. And, uh, okay, now you have a breadboard here. I mean, you can't got one of your... No, I don't have one of mine. No. I don't know. The only one I know, Aunt Rose had one, and I got lost somehow in the thing. Mother had, everybody in a ration had one. And, of course, we sold them, you know, uh, at such a good price that when I got all done paying for the uh, wages, I had Delbert, Carlson, my one cousin, and Gordy working for me. There's three of us. And we had a paint shop, and we had a filing shop, and a saw shop. And Grandpa would buy the lumber at uh, United Lumber. Well, the first batch he gave me, and it was a lot of yellow pine. And we sold them for about a buck a piece, and sold them just like that. And everybody wanted one in the bird board. And then I told Dad I got to have more lumber. He says, "Well, have you got any money for the, for him to go buy the lumber?" What was that? I forgot about that. I paid wages, <laughs> I bought paint, and we had no money to buy more lumber. So that was the end of the lumber of the uh, bread bone factory. You're bankrupt. Gangsters were kind of heroes in those days too, you know, that's a shame of it. I mean, not heroes as such, but you, uh, you knew them. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Babyface Nelson, Al Capone, you, know, you knew all of these guys because it was so much in the press. Mm -hmm. And of course I would draw characters of these guys and then wanted and I had a file and uh, you know that sort of stuff. And uh, the dentist I went to then was Dr. Burton. I told him about my detective agency. And uh, he said something about, well, what does your mother think of And I said, well, she thinks I'm touched. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had uh, Burt Raymond delivered a paper, a morning paper. That's the same Burt Raymond who was... Uh, the, the redhead, yeah, that did our, yeah, out here, that's the guy, yeah. And uh, he would tie the morning paper on a rope outside my window, and then I would, when I'd wake up, I'd just pull the paper up. And I'd been doing that, my dad was, came home from being gone for a couple of weeks. He's down to get the paper, and he come into my mother. He says, "Where's the morning paper?" Well, he you check in Lyle's room, and you know, I was sitting reading the paper. <laughs> How? And you know, he knew I didn't get up. It made noise, and then I had to tell him what I had hanging on a rope, <laughs> pulling it up in the morning. <laughs> 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 and Hank Campbell, next kid, and I, we had the, those uh, SOS, uh, you know, the things between us, and we never could get that Morse code down Morse right. Code, yeah. So we'd stick our heads out the window and holler. You know, <laughs> I said this, I said that. And we could never read the Morse code, but we tried. <laughs> it didn't work too good. This was all on 75 Sturgis, huh? Yeah, I went to Fox Street School, mm -hmm. and uh, six grades of that, and uh, well, seven, I guess, because of kindergarten, and through sixth grade. Then uh, Washington Junior High, and I think about the second year in Washington Junior High, or maybe even the last one, we moved to around the corner, 356 Price Street. They were selling the house we were renting, and Mother was so, uh, the neighborhood meant so much to, you know, and our Peterson, or our Carlson family, rather, were all Northsiders. It's a funny thing how things happen. Just like your mother, were almost their whole family was on the west side, and when you where you seemed to locate every Rose and Rudy and and Doc, everybody lived on the north side. So when the house was sold out from under us, and Dad was going to move us somewhere else, he she cried, I cried. I didn't want to leave school. You know, let's not think of going anywhere but staying on that north side. And mother especially because she loved the neighborhood and all her friends and and relatives were there. So we bought a house right around the corner and when we moved we carried everything we never even hired a truck because a whitey and yeah. and doc and all of them you know would come up and, and they carried a sofa and carried it right around the corner and the refrigerator wheeled it up on a, on a thing you know we never never used a truck or anything that's was that close just to 356 price street so then you stayed that was your home right through uh, my home through uh, well until yeah, till, uh, till i got married yeah right yeah right yeah and of course yeah, I was two years, you know, in the Navy and then college and all that stuff, and so uh, I didn't spend as much time in that house as, as, as the other ones. Sturgis Street was my real growing up house. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was tough times for everybody. But you, we didn't know we were poor. Nobody knew we were, because we're all, everybody's in the same boat. We lived in a very middle class neighborhood, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, was, we're all same same things. Uh, nobody was on uh, welfare or anything like that. You got by. But... Uh, one of the vivid things about the Depression I remember is Dad went down to uh, Grizzle, well, had the meat market then, I can't think of his first name, and Dad came home with Hamburg wrapped in just a piece of, of uh, cellophane, you know, or, uh, yeah, plastic. And Mother says, what in the world? Turn his hand. He says, the uh, constable or what have you had come and taken his paper away because he couldn't pay his bills. So he didn't have no paper to put the meat in, so you, when you got the meat, you, you got it literally in your bare hands to take it home. The right. poor guy was, wasn't able to pay his bills. Our names was not Peterson. It was uh, uh, Nicholson, Nicholson. 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 And his father was Petter Nickel, Nicholson. And uh, he changed his name to uh, Peter's son because he was the son of Peter. Mm -hmm. And that's how that, uh, that happened. But our names really should be Nicholson happen. Some of the kids would, would like to be Nicholson because it's a little different than a yeah. common Peterson. Yeah. It didn't work out that way. But the only one that saw any uh, action was Otto. Yeah. He was a machine gunner. You know you know all that stuff. And, um, Would you talk about that? No, you couldn't get him to talk much about it. And I was telling Amy, uh, Amy last night, you found out in later life of guys that did something in the service or saw something, they didn't much fun to talk about it. Yeah. Bad stuff. Uh, a guy who talked a lot about his service usually, you know, he didn't do a, do, do a great deal or see a, see a lot, but uh, I can remember one thing, we, we went in uh, Washington, Pennsylvania, Mother and I were traveling with him, and we went to uh, the movie All Quiet on the Western Front, and I told Amy last night too, that the Petersons were not emotional people. We came out of that movie, All Quiet on the Western Front, and we were in the lobby, 
And my mother, you know, nudged me. She says, look at your father, she says. And he was he had tears in his eyes. And she says, you'll never see that again. And I never did until she died. Uh, but that, that movie got to him because, of course, it's all on Germans and the kids. And he knew he'd killed a lot of Germans. I mean, you, you couldn't be a machine gunner or part of that thing unless you, you, you killed people, you know, and killed probably a lot of them. In fact, of his uh, three-man crew in that uh, machine gun thing, he was the only one who was come out alive. The other two guys were killed. He was gassed, you know, but he, was, he lived. But the other two, the other Did two he were complain killed. about his condition? Uh, I can remember him having some episodes when I was a young kid. Yeah, yeah. What were yeah. they? What were the episodes? Well, he pass out from, uh, and it was to go. They, the mother would get him to the doctor and all that stuff, and he said it was his lungs. And was you know, it scared you? Oh, sure, sure. Because remember, he passed out one time down at uh, uh, Red and White Grocery Store, we're getting groceries, the three of us, and he did, and it was nothing more than that. And we got the doctor it was his lungs. But then he continued to smoke. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't give it up. Mother, she hid cigarettes. She did everything to make him quit, and you know. He did quit for a while, and he was, he was, he was she, she, she was, she was so, he was de so depressed that she went and got the cigarettes. She said, I can't take this. She says, <laughs> he was just a different guy. You're a family of one. That's right. There's a lot of them that way. Why is that? Uh, uh, depression. No, no question about it. They couldn't raise any more kids. I mean, in that whole neighborhood of ours. Uh, you almost, uh, you could, I could name me uh, probably five families that had one child, and they couldn't afford any more. Who was the disciplinarian in your family? Oh, my mother. Oh, yeah. You know, she... <laughs> She used yardsticks and switches and everything she could get her hand on, on me, but no, my dad, he'd, he'd tell her what I'd done, you know, but uh, he, I don't ever remember getting a licking from him. Um, maybe get balled out, but but she was, oh gosh, yes, yeah, she, she, she beat me up. You'll never have that memory, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Your mother wasn't the one, huh? <laughs> no, I, my dad, because he wasn't home, too, you know, and it would be tough for him to come home and discipline me for something I'd done on Monday, and this is Thursday or Friday, you know. And uh, but they would talk it over, mm -hmm. and you the trips to the Gary home and all that stuff that would happen, and uh, you know <laughs> they, they shook me up. But uh, it really happened. Huh? It really did happen. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, it did. That that them are true stories. Yeah. <laughs> one more one more screw up, and this is where you're going to end up. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we'd ride out there and come on home. <laughs> so yeah, they uh, they wanted they wanted a perfect kid, but they didn't I guess think they had one. So that was what happened. Rachel was the boss in the family. And uh, she, when we went to look at houses, we probably looked at ten houses, and she'd find something wrong with every house. And your mother and I would come back into our little room down there in Sturt Street, and uh, Gladys would be upset. And, well, I would be too. I said, well, "Not well, in our world, you know, they, they, they can't find anything that pleases her." And we had to please her because we had to get money. Mm -hmm. See, so it was, a, it was a, it was a, we we didn't have much say in this thing. Well, then this house came up in Allen Park, and we came up here and looked at this. And we met afterwards, you know, we'd get together with mothers or whatever, how we did this each time. And she said, I think that's a good house for you. Now, man, your mother was a stag, and because this is the one she really wanted anyway. And the uh, mother said, okay. <coughs> so they lent us the money and uh, we, we bought the house. I was pregnant. And the day we signed the papers up at Kenny Johnson's office, your mother uh, period came around because she was all whacked up because of giving birth to you. And her cycles would be way out of whack. And this time had gone, you know, longer, and we just knew she was pregnant, and that's why we had to buy this house. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Saturday that we did, and, uh, we we did not have to buy the house, but we had the house, yeah. so it worked out. And yeah. it was within a few months later she was pregnant with Randy, so yeah. it worked out. But that's how we got this house, and it was, like I say, she was. We talk about Allen Park and all these things here, about how we got up in here, and that was because we satisfied Rach. That really he could not live without without her. I really do. I think a lot of the mother agrees in that it was a really a tough time for him. But uh, he didn't show it. But it was uh, great way he went. You know. Well, you were with me the night we found him, and uh, that was very upsetting because mother just died six months before that. And uh, but uh, that was that's I'm, I'm convinced that's what happened with him. Mm -hmm. He just just gave up. In fact, grandma died on your birthday, mm -hmm. and he died in. He died almost on my birthday in July. Mm -hmm. yeah. She don't have been in the hospital a few days. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't any length of time at all. No, no. And uh, that was an. I was bowling. I came home here, and Otto's car was out front, and I come running in, and I said something was wrong, you know. And, and he, then he told me that he'd taken mother to the hospital and all that. And we went over there that night, and the next day, and I was thinking about the next day she died. Mm -hmm. Her kidneys shut down, mm -hmm. and that's something you can't live with, you know. I mean, uh, it, that that's. Uh, Wedding felt 
was right with her, gave her a shot. We remember that mother was talking about the other day, and no more giving her a, a shot of whatever he did, and and, and she died. So in 1964, both of them went in that same year. You bought a camp. We bought a camp the next year, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we start going out Sundays, remember for lunch and all this stuff here, because we just want to do some things with Dad's money and stuff like that that uh, he wanted to pass around. So uh, yeah, yeah, we started other things to kind of take the herd up.